everyone's with his dad, so. Mm. Grab him off to the The live is on. Good morning, everybody. We're just waiting while everybody logs on. I'm going to find the broadcast myself here, just a second. Maybe. And as we're logging on, would everybody please share our broadcast? If I can even find it. My page is reloading and looking for it. Yeah, if you could just go down to the, it's in the right little corner, right, and click the share to your pages. And Holly is here. She's just going to be loading us up with our uh, guest star, our guest we have today, Dr. Dana Stern. There we are. I'm going to share to my page. Share now. And share to my tips of the trade. Post there. So I'm not alone. I've got Holly with me. She's just behind the phone at the moment. And we have Dr. Stern. Good Yay. morning, Dr. Stern. Good morning, Dr. Dana. Good morning. Did you get her started? Hooray for technology. Right? So cool. When it, works, it's, when it works, it's wonderful. Yes, exactly. <laughs> technology does what it's good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can our viewers, can you let us know if you can hear Dr. Dana okay? And thank you for sharing. We see we got some shares on there. Thank you. Oh, wow. Hi from India, Michelle. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Let, give a thumbs up if you can see and hear Dr. Stern. Okay. Sure. Just lower yourself just a tad. There we go. <laughs> so I'm not hovering over here. Right. And I'm going to share the broadcast as well. If all of you would please go ahead and share the broadcast so that everyone can get in and see Dr. Stern. Looks like we kind of did kind of. We somebody said matching shirts. It looks like we did kind of all get the same memo on the similar color, right? Even <laughs> coordinated with us. That's awesome. Yeah, definitely not planned. <laughs> no, that was like pure luck. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna share it on fingernail fixer. And then share it on my personal page. Yep, I got them shared on both. Brilliant. And can everyone hear Dr. Dana okay? Yes, we've got some thumbs up. Okay. Excellent. Good deal. And I'm going to share on my personal page right quick. <laughs> and it looks like our viewers are getting in. Everybody's getting logged in. Did everyone bring questions with them today? Hi, Katie. I believe Katie is joining us from the UK. Is she? All right. Hi, Katie. Hi, Katie. She was one of the um, Nails Magazine NTNA competitors. Oh, nice. So wow. amazing work. Perfect. So I've shared. Yes. And looks like, yay, the comments are here. Brilliant. Good morning, everyone. Oh, wow, we've got a new tech still in training, as well as being from the Caribbean. Yay nice. for being nail. Who else is new? How many other new nail professionals do we have? We'd love to know who else is new. And why didn't everyone just say, like, how many years have you been a licensed nail professional or a cosmetologist doing nails. Leave us a little comment and let's see where everyone's experience is. I've been doing nails for 19 years. How about you? 17 years. Brilliant. So we've been around the block for a little while. A little while. But definitely students and new professionals <laughs> are the future of the industry. So oh, we're yes. always excited to have you join us. Yes. So we'd love to see kind of who else is in the veteran range as well as who else is in the beginner range and who's in between yes and we're watching the comments to see how long <laughs> you guys have been doing nails <laughs> oh katie says she's been looking forward to this fabulous chat awesome we're glad to have you katie thanks yes. for joining us cool 
Oh, another student. Brilliant. Oh, I see Lisa and Victoria, and I know both of them are veterans. And we've got Alpha. An Alpha. She's a veteran. Yes. Oh, there we go. Nail tech for six years. Developed a career four years ago. Brilliant, Rebecca. Great. Hey, 11 years. Tina, seven, seven. years. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> Victoria's joining us from Canada. So cool. We've got a really nice range, range of experience. Yes. We've got all the way from newbies to some veterans. And some educators. Yes. You, can never, you should never stop learning. I, I feel like I can never learn enough. Right? I always get at least one thing out of a class. Yes. Always. Always. 30 years. Wow. Wow, Lisa. We got two 30 years. 28 like years. And Lisa. Nice. 28 years as well. Brilliant. We've got a really wide range of experience. That's awesome. So let's go into talking to Dr. Dana Stern. For those of you that are not familiar with Dr. Dana, you can look her up on the Nails Magazine website. Also, I will really quick drop a link to her website in the chat for you. Let me pluck it out of my screen and drop it right over here into chat for you. Um, Dr. Dana is a dermatologist and she has done some really cool things with nails. She has even done surgery on nails. Like, can you imagine that's, seeing inside all of that? That's kind of mind blowing. Right? It's like, oh my gosh. So <laughs> eyesight for one thing. And then a really cool knowledge base for the nail professional. Because how often have you sent someone to their general doctor and they come back and like, my doctor had no idea what was going on. My doctor said I should do this. And even as a professional nail tech, you're like, um, that would not be my recommendation. Right, like, no, don't do that. <laughs> and I have even gone to my personal physician and been like, okay, you know, this issue is going on with my toenail. I stubbed it and now it's shedding and this is what's going on. Um, it looks like there's this damage and that from the matrix. And she's like, it sounds like you know more about it than I do. So just go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's really exciting to have a doctor that actually knows a lot about nails and is willing to share that information with us. So what we're looking for today is to take full advantage of Dr. Stern's knowledge. Yes. So hit us with your questions. We want to see them in the comments. And we're going to help Dr. Stern watch the comments. Yes. So if you ask a question while she's answering another question, we'll make sure and keep tabs of the yes. questions so that we get to all of them. Yes. So I just also want to say thank you for having me. I am so thrilled to be here with this audience. I love Nails Magazine. I've been involved with the magazine for a long time. And um, it's interesting, that little tidbit, I completely agree I can't tell you how many general physicians will refer patients to me and, you know, really not have a broad knowledge of nails. Mm -hmm. um, so just, you know, a little, I'm so happy to share my knowledge, but obviously I'm in New York, so I can't always see all of your patients. If you do have questions um, regarding clients, I would suggest starting with a dermatologist as far as providers because we, we are trained to treat skin, hair, and nails. And even if the dermatologist is not necessarily a nail specialist like myself, they're going to have a pretty broad-based knowledge, and they'll know kind of where to refer your client if they need to. Awesome. And it's always nice to have a doctor that knows the difference between the epinicium, the proximal nail fold, and the cuticle. Yes, true cuticle. Right? Yes. <laughs> And Dr. Stern, do you want to give us just a little bit of background on how long you've been working with nails? Sure. With Nails Magazine or nails in general? <laughs> Fingernails in general, both. Um, so I've been treating nail patients for over a decade. Um, I was, this started long ago before I was even um, in practice, I was chief resident in dermatology at, in Mount Sinai in, in New York City. Um, and prior to that, I had done a couple years of clinical research, and that's really how I got started in nails. I did this big study on brittle nails, which ended up having some very kind of groundbreaking new results that changed a lot that was out there in the textbooks. And 
from there on, I just became really interested in nails. And when I first started practicing, my practice was probably about 10% nails. And over the years, it has become my my office in New York City is 100% focused on nails. And I'm the only dermatologist in the country whose entire practice is devoted to nails. So wow. nails are, you know, we have a lot of overlap, just like you nails are my corner of the universe. And I always feel very strongly that physicians and nail professionals are really in a collaborative type of relationship um, because we have so much overlap. That's so cool. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> like the, like CJ we had on last week said mm -hmm. we are the first responders. Some, so sometimes we are the ones that actually see the issues and we send them on to the professional, the medical. Absolutely. That's such a great way of saying yes, it. I really and, like you know, and there are a lot of serious things that you as nail professionals see. And while you're not responsible um, to know all of this medical knowledge, you are in a very unique um, and potentially very influential position to your clients. So it's really, it's, it's really terrific that so many of you are enthused and curious about continuing to learn because same with medicine, you know, we, we view it as a lifelong learning field. And that I find that nail professionals very much tend to have that same philosophy, um, which is unusual. You know, if you look at other professions, there's a lot of kind of stagnation, but I think nails in particular, there's so much innovation in the industry, which kind of forces you to keep up but it also attracts some folks who enjoy that kind of stimulation. So it's, there's really a lot of similarities to medicine. Yeah. In that. <laughs> Nail geeks to the core. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. We have a question. Do you want to read that? Um, our question is from Farisi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She says, hello from Greece. Would like to know the doctor's opinion about hardware, also known as the Russian manicure is becoming the trend here in Greece. Although many of us disagree, including myself, I would like to hear the doctor's opinion. Great question. So are you referring to incorporate, I just wanna make sure I'm clear, are you referring to incorporating like metals into the manicure or? So what, I've seen that in general, what people think of as the Russian manicure, they're actually removing any epinichium and proximal nail fold using an e-file. And they're generally using special bits for the e-file that have been designed to remove that skin. Wow. <laughs> and does Nails Magazine have um, kind of a statement on how you guys have been responding to this new trend? I'm just curious. Nails Magazine actually has to stay neutral on something like that legally. And um, it... It generally is a very controversial topic within the industry because you have those that really advocate for it and say it's just a careful exfoliation, which could be true if someone is like really well trained and being really careful. However, um, there is a doctor from Russia that has shared some photos of what the micro damage can be from a Russian manicure. So there are definitely two very strong sides, which is why she's right. asking for an opinion from a professional phys physician standpoint. Right. Well, I think you kind of hit it when you said, you know, there's so much um, user skill variation. And I think with any new kind of technique, um, obviously nobody is out to cause trauma or health issues to their clients. In the end, you know, we all want our patients and our clients really to have beautiful, healthy looking nails. Um, however, when I hear filing near the, um, epinichium and the proximal nail fold, that makes me nervous, um, because a lot can go wrong in you know, really the wrong hands or somebody who potentially doesn't really understand the anatomy 
100%. Um, and so, you know, I will just tell you one of the biggest potential issues with working in that area is the proximal nail fold directly overlies the proximal nail matrix. Now the matrix, you see the distal matrix as the half moon, but the proximal matrix is right behind um, really the cuticle and underneath the proximal nail fold. And that is what turns into the top of the nail, the part of the hard nail that's actually visible so long story short, any kind of damage to that proximal nail fold can result in permanent, believe it or not, damage to that new nail coming in. You might not see it for a couple months, but it's definitely going to show up. And so in addition to the obvious other risks when you breach, you know, the, um, the true cuticle infections and such, the real damage with what, what I'm now learning as the Russian manicure would be permanent damage to the nail matrix, almost like when people experience, you know, trauma to their nail from getting their nail caught in a door. You've all seen those nails before. You, the last thing you want to be doing is inducing that, you know, doing one of these um, new manicures. I'm dying to see what these look like, though. <laughs> we can There's, hook you up with some videos. <laughs> uh, they, they, Great. Put a, a link in the comments to oh, for some, perfect. For some pictures. We have another question, too. Yes. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. All right. Our next question is from Kim. She would like to know, what would you say is the best way to go about connecting with a medical professional and getting them to take you seriously in wanting to network and learn from them? That's an excellent question because I've had the same issue when I tried to. Yeah, they kind of laugh at you. Yeah, like, why do you, how would you know what you're talking about? Yes. That's kind of the experience I've had. I am so sad to hear that. I can't tell you how many um, nail professionals in New York refer patients to me, and I'm always so impressed by them. And in fact, I refer back to them because, you know, knowing that they, are taking things seriously and sending their clients to a physician makes me feel like they're really competent and um, on top of it. So that's disappointing to hear, um, but great question. I would, again, I mentioned this before, but if you're just tuning in, start with a board certified dermatologist. We are really trained to treat skin, hair, and nails. Um, you know, obviously podiatrists treat toenails um, and they are, there is some overlap with, with podiatry and what we do, but I will say board certified dermatologists, we go through very rigorous training and recertification. And I just actually took my research. There were tons of nail questions on the boards. We're all expected to know the basics of nails. Um, so what I would suggest is finding a few dermatologists in your community, writing them a nice letter, maybe send some cards, introduce yourself and, you know, explain to them, I'm a nail professional. I often see nail issues in my practice that I think are medical and beyond what I should be advising and treating. And I would love to have a professional colleague or, you know, somebody in the community to refer to. Trust me, everybody wants new clients, new patients, and um, I think they would find that to be really appealing, and um, I think that would go a long way. So maybe the trick is finding a dermatologist or a podiatrist that actually deals in nails versus having a heavier skin and skin or hair clientele? Well... Yes, there are, of course, dermatologists who only do cosmetics these days. Mm -hmm. um, so you would definitely, any dermatologist who's, who is considered to be a general dermatologist, and you can call their office and say, hey, do you, does your office treat nails? You know, I have a nail issue. Um, and you'll very quickly find out, nope, we only do Botox. <laughs> or <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we, we see everything, you know, and that's a great way to hone in on who to refer to. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 
Great question. I think our next one there is from Eileen. Perfect. You want to read Eileen's? Okay. Eileen says, I've heard of nail tech suffering from contact dermatitis from product exposure. I've had no issue for 30 years. I'm lucky. Am I lucky or am I the others just doing something wrong? Great question. I'm loving this. Question. Yeah. So, so what you're describing is what's called an allergic contact dermatitis. Mm -hmm. um, and that occurs from small repeat exposures of a specific antigen, which over time your immune system starts to recognize. And as these repeat exposures occur, your immune system is kind of building up this army that's getting ready to attack. And then when they finally get, you know, another exposure of, of that allergen, it's full fledged not good. Full fledged, um, right? Yes. Are you visualizing <laughs> little green army men yeah. under your skin? <laughs> so, so the key point is that this is something that requires several repeat exposures of this repeat, what we call answer, antigen or allergen. So that, you know, in that respect, it, there is skill involved in kind of not leaking certain chemicals out onto the surrounding skin, um, you know, being very precise in the way you work, um, perhaps wearing gloves with certain um, activities, you know, pouring things in and out of containers. It's, it's the way that you work. So it's not just luck in that sense, um, because it's not a one-time exposure. Unfortunately, the people who tend to get these allergies have had these repeat exposures. Mm -hmm. With that said, that doesn't mean that that person is careless. Um, you know, certain people tend to be more reactive than others. Um, and that's, you know, for sure. You know, some of us have seasonal allergies, some of us don't. But um, I don't think it's purely luck, honestly. I think that, you know, developing kind of really good habits when working with products is really about safety, but it's also, um, it's about your health, importantly. And this is where something like wearing gloves for your services can come mm -hmm. in handy. Um, using a funnel when you're refilling your station containers from your bulk containers so that it's not leaking down the side of the container where your hand is holding it. Mm -hmm. And just lots of little things like mm -hmm. that. Um, paying those few pennies extra to have the plastic back pads so that they mm -hmm. contain your liquids and keep them off of your glove. <coughs> and just lots of little things like that yeah. really add up to prevention because overexposure is preventable. So those of you that are new professionals joining us in the broadcast, definitely take note and do these preventable things so that five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, you're not having to decide if you need to give up a career that you love because your products are making you sick. Exactly. That's great advice. And I'm just going to add that you know, there is, again, a lot of overlap with medicine. We work with all sorts of liquids, peels, chemicals, and I always recommend having what's called kind of an order of operations when you're working so that, you know, a salon can be a distracting place. You're talking to your clients. The phones are ringing. You know, there's interruptions. You want that kind of work to be almost brainless, like it's just automatic. First you do the funnel, then you pour, then you, you know, so that when you have all of those distractions, it's just a, a rote kind of mm -hmm. process. Just how you do it. Um, Your SOP yeah. standard operational procedure. <laughs> yes, exactly. We have another question. This one is from Victoria in Canada. How does one find a doctor or dermatologist willing to do laser treatments or something similar for fungal fingernails that are yellow, brittle, have onycholysis? 
She knows of someone that she keeps referring to local podiatrists who will refuse to do it because it's on her fingers and not on her toes. Okay, so yes, podiatrists definitely do not treat fingernails. Um, onychomycosis is, you know, obviously a very broad and common male finding that we're all familiar with. Um, you know, supposedly it affects about 14% of the U.S. population, which is 35 million people. So, you know, it's common. Um, but I will say it's commonly misdiagnosed. So, for example, only 50% of abnormal toenails are actually fungal. You know, I get referred from all sorts of physicians and um, just people and they assume that because they have abnormal looking toenails, it must be fungus. Well, the first step is accurate diagnosis. And when it comes to the fingernails, that is especially true because I have to tell you, fingernail fungus, not so common. Yes, we see separation. We see onycholysis, which is when the nail lifts off the bed, which people always assume is fungus. That's actually not fungus. That is what we call a barrier compromise. So the nail has kind of lifted up and things are getting under there secondarily. I don't even consider that a fungal infection. If there's a little yeast under there, that's easy to treat um, and not really a true like toenail fungal infection. So my advice, if you have a client with what you think is a fingernail fungus, Again, send them to a dermatologist. We know how to treat onycholysis. Um, and this patient or this client has to be properly diagnosed. And I will just add that there are really two scenarios where we see fingernail fungus, okay? Of course, there are exceptions to this, but the broad categories are people who are immunosuppressed, so very ill people, who, you know, unfortunately their immune system has been compromised in some way. And the second scenario are people who have a tremendous fungal load somewhere else, typically the feet with, with athlete's foot, tinea pedis, onychomycosis, which is fungal, true fungal infections of the toenails. They may have jock itch. They may have, um, you know, even tinea corporis, which is re referred to as ringworm. So what typically happens is, especially when it's on the feet, it can be transferred to the fingernails. And I've seen this a lot. We call it one hand, two foot onychomycosis. When the patient is loaded with fungus on the feet and they're constantly touching their feet. Besides that, it's very unusual to see just a, an isolated fungal infection of the fingernails where there's no foot involvement or no large fungal load somewhere else. So again, accurate diagnosis is first and foremost before anything else. So recommend them to call the dermatologist and ask if they do laser treatments on the fingers first. I think that's kind of- Okay, well- Let's go back to laser treatment because I know that there's, there's a lot of misunderstandings about laser treatment too. Lasers are FDA approved to approve, improve the appearance of fungal nails, okay? Okay. Okay. Again, I see tons of patients who have spent thousands of dollars on laser and guess what they don't even have fungus okay and just so you know most dermatologists have not jumped on the laser fungal bandwagon because the data is really not great um we're still pretty skeptical about whether lasers are really the right approach for nails it's a huge expense um and the efficacy of these devices really hasn't panned out yet. So I know they're popular and every, you know, there's a lot of belief in this country in particular in the U S that, you know, lasers can kind of fix anything, but unfortunately that's not the case. So I would not jump to laser. 
um, especially for fingernails that probably don't have like a typical fungus. Great. Thank you for that information. It is interesting. We do kind of tend to get on a kick if something is trending. Then, of course, everyone wants to participate in it. And we do oftentimes get a lot of misinformation, especially with the prevalence of social media. Yeah, absolutely. The next question after that is kind of a follow up from Victoria. She would like to know, considering that we are using solvents most of the day, would you recommend nail techs wear nitrile gloves for services to prevent overexposure? Um, a quick chime in from me, I would suggest the nitrile gloves and I found that you need to have an eight mil thick thickness at minimum to prevent your natural nails from poking through <clears throat> them or your solvents from working your way through them. Um, Dr. Stern, what is your positioning on wearing the nitrile gloves in the salon? Well, I think, you know, any kind of barrier protection is obviously going to potentially help. A lot, of course, has to do with the size of these solvents and, you know, the porosity of these gloves. So that I, I can't answer because um, I don't know if the gloves actually fully protect if, for example, these solvents were to saturate them. Um, but, you know, gloves are always a good idea when you're working with chemicals. And, you know, ask any chemist, they, they all wear gloves. <laughs> that, that recommendation comes from Doug Shun, one of our industry chemists, just as a preventative measure, because the nitrile is a little more solvent resistant than other mediums. Okay, so, I mean, I trust Doug in that respect, and, um, you know, I'm in agreement there. Brilliant. And then what do we have I after? Have a question about the UV lights. Okay, that was the next one. All right, so our next question comes from Lisa. Could you touch on UV lamps and the concerns that people have with using them for nail services? Sure. Um, well, when you say people, are we talking clients? I'm yes. assuming we're talking consumers. Usually our consumers are coming back and they've seen on Dr. Oz or on the latest expose on their news channel about things that they're going to get from getting their nails done and putting their hands in the UV lamps. And they're right. convinced that those are hidden dangers that we're hiding from them. Okay. Um, well, I think a lot of this has been fully elucidated now, so we can really talk um, with some data behind us at this point, because the gels, as we all know, they've been around and there's been a lot of studies. So, and I will mention that I recently had my first gel manicure <laughs> when I was in Korea, which was a lot of fun. Um, so there, we really should break this down into kind of the UV concerns and then, um, so the UV concerns are as they relate to the skin and believe it or not, the eyes. Right. Um, I'll start with the skin. I'm a board certified dermatologist. There's been tons of studies. I know there was some concern about um, risk of skin cancer it's really, really, really unlikely that if even if you have a UV gel manicure every week, let's call it every 10 days, there is such a minimal to zero risk of getting a skin cancer from that. And this has been studied. I've read all of these studies. Um, in fact, very interestingly, in dermatology, we use UV as a form of therapy for certain skin conditions, psoriasis, eczema. So we're able to kind of, we know the risks of those treatments. So a lot of these better studies compared the, that UV exposure to the exposure that you're getting from the UV lights in the salon. And it's, it's a tiny, tiny amount of exposure. So we're really not hung up on that risk anymore. What I will say is that I would suggest protecting the skin just from the photo damaging perspective, okay? Because essentially, 
even if it is an LED light, the light has to be in a certain, a, a certain specific wavelength mm -hmm. to cure the gel, as you guys all know. And that wavelength can induce photo damage to the skin. And by that, I mean collagen breakdown, brown spots, things of that nature. So I know that the American Board of Dermatology has issued statements on this. We do recommend either applying a sunscreen or they sell those fingerless gloves now. I don't know if you all are using these in, in your salons, um, but I highly would suggest doing that if you're somebody who gets gel manicures frequently. Um, all right. The um, eye concerns. I've talked to a few ophthalmologists about this, and this is common sense. If you go to a dermatologist and you have something lasered, everybody in the room is wearing protective eyewear, right? So if you are seeing the light, that is not good. It can um, potentially damage the visual field. Um, what's recommended is if it's a UV light that you just wear regular broad spectrum sunglasses like you would wear if you were out on a boat mm -hmm. and the LEDs apparently a yellow orange lens is ideal. That's if you're seeing the light. Um, just food for thought. Now something interesting as it relates to the skin and the nails is what we call phototoxicity. So there are certain medications that when you ingest them and you're exposed to light it can cause an adverse or negative effect on the skin. Mm -hmm. Some of these are very common, things like doxycycline, minocycline, tetracycline. They're used to treat acne, they're used to treat Lyme's disease. So these can cause a reaction when exposed to UV light. Obviously, you're not taking a full medical history um, of your patients, but this is something a lot of people are not aware of. Um, there's also something called photoonycholysis, which is when you take a certain medication, your nails are exposed to light, and they literally lift off the nail beds. And that can happen from the tetracycline antibiotics as well. So, you know, these are rare, but they can happen. Um, the last concern with the gels, which is probably the one that everybody talks about the most is the actual damage to the nails, right? And um, my personal feeling from, you know, reading about this, seeing patients who do this, is that most of the damage occurs in the removal process. Um, there's not necessarily going to be damage, but um, when there is, it can cause thinning of the nail plate. And again, this has been studied in the medical literature. Um, one of my nail colleagues, Tosti, published an interesting study on this. Um, so I'm sure that you all are aware that you should always use the same brand for the entire gel process. So you don't want to be mixing, you know, the first layer of this brand with color from this brand. Obviously, they're formulated to work together. Um, and then you all can probably speak to the removal process better than I can. Um, but, um, you know, there's all sorts of approaches and you have to really read the manufacturer's instructions and follow, you know, what that particular brand is recommending. Um, because once you kind of go out into left field, that's when the problems start. Um, but I will say my gel manicure, my nails, they weren't perfect when, when it came off, but they were certainly not damaged. Um, I was very happy and my, I was so excited about it because I just loved the way the manicure looked. It was so nice to ha not have to worry about chips while I was away working and yep. my husband was like seriously are you telling me you're becoming a gel person <laughs> 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 all 
but I definitely see the appeal. And if it's done right, um, I, I tell my patients an occasional gel manicure is fine. Um, but bearing in mind my whole laundry list of precautions that I just went over with you all. So it sounds like we should definitely add into our basic client consultation an inquiry if they're taking any medications that make yes. them sensitive to light. Yes. So yeah. that would definitely be something you could just pop into your inquiry every two weeks or three weeks when they come into the salon because some of them, as she mentioned, are antibiotics. And so that may not be something that they're taking all of the time. So just kind of popping that into your general mention when you say, you know, how did you get along with your nails this past time? Do you have any questions? Are you by chance taking any medications that make you light sensitive? And just being aware of those types of things. And just to reiterate, a lot of times we're always telling people it's really important that you use a system. And they're like, oh, you're just being a snob. Blah, blah, blah. And systems are really important. And it's why we and Doug and so many others in the industry will say, if you're using more than one system, that's okay because you're giving your clients options. Just make sure you're using it as a system and the system <coughs> includes the UV light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. And even if it's an LED light, it's still putting out UV and it's still a mm -hmm. section of the system. So that's not just us being nail snobs, that is literally a legitimately scientifically proven mm -hmm. safety precaution for your clientele. Yep. All right. What do you have on? Okay, Phyllis. Phyllis has a question. My mother-in-law has a milk white color on her fingers and toes. Her physician said it can only be treated with a drug that will harm her liver. She's a very ill person and does not want to take this medication. Is there anything else she could do? And if she gets a polish or gel polish manicure, can it be transferred to others? The physician told her it was a fungus. Okay. So this is a common theme for all of us. <laughs> um, you know, accurate diagnosis. When I hear white, is that what you had said? White patches on the nails? But it's a milk white color on the fingers and toes. Okay, so milk white color on the fingernails and toes can be many, many, many things. We call, it's, it's really referred to as leukonychia. And there is what we call a long differential diagnosis for what that can be. Um, so I don't know, obviously, who this physician was, but, you know, everybody wants to say it's fungus. <laughs> I'm a skeptic. Um, you know, this could be many, many things. And again, I would, before jumping into um, what this physician is recommending, which sounds like Lamisil, it's, a, it's an oral medication commonly used to treat nail fungus. This, this woman needs an accurate diagnosis, um, and I'm willing to bet that the fingernails are not fungal. <laughs> and that's an, that's an issue with generally what was mentioned earlier, getting a physician to take you as a nail professional seriously and finding someone that you can trust to send your clients to, that they're not just going to say, oh, it's a fungus you can take this or you can just deal with it. They're so blase about calling just anything a fungus and dismissing people's concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the differentiator there could be definitely seeking out a podiatrist or a dermatologist that actually work with nails versus a general practitioner that does tend to be like, eh, it's a fungus, have some medicine and yeah, go away. Take this. Yeah. Yes. Right. I, I agree with that. Want to address um, that one or this one? Or do, you, uh, do you want to read Janine's? Okay. Next thing is from Janine. It says, "Hi there. Would like to know, uh, know how, or would like to know how do I know when it's safe to work on clients' nails when her nails look either unhealthy or discolored? 
I am terrified of fungal infections. Also, what preventative measures could I take to be absolutely prevent fungus from spreading to my products and utensils? Great question. Well, first, let's talk about your protection. I mean, I would say that when in doubt, wear gloves. I mean, you know, I touch people's fingernails and toenails all day long myself. And I really can't imagine doing it without gloves. Um, you know, especially when, you know, the nice thing about nails is that we can see them. You know, we're not talking about a liver or a kidney here. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you're seeing a nail that's yellow and doesn't look right to you, first order of business is protecting yourself. Um, so, you know, wear a pair of gloves. Don't worry about that making anybody feel uncomfortable. You, this is your livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as preventing fungus in the salon, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I will say one of the biggest things that I see being done wrong in salons, because I go to them. I love to go to nail salons. I like to look around. I like to see, you know, the new products and how people um, run their businesses one-time use items. Uh -huh. <laughs> there is a big category here. We're talking emery boards. Mm -hmm. We're talking buffers. We're talking anything that's porous. Orange wood. Toe, se <laughs> toe separators. Um, you know, orange sticks. Mm -hmm. It's I can't tell you how many times I have been to salons where they are about to file my nails with an emery board that looks like it probably was, had touched, you know, 20 people's toenails, mm -hmm. which is honestly my nightmare. <laughs> um, and out of us. that fungus is very easy to transmit. Um, you know, there's even been studies showing that basically fungus is everywhere, but if you're actually using a tool from one client to another that is porous and not able to be properly disinfected, you are absolutely going to be transferring that. So that's, that's a huge thing. And I think, you know, most nail professionals, especially people like you who are tuning in and are interested in learning and are highly aware of that. So, um, you know, this is kind of old news to you, but um, it's, it's something that always shocks me when I, when I go to salons. I will mention um, one item that I think people don't really think about, and that are the cuticle oils. Now, the cuticle oils, ideally should not be applied to the cuticle and then reinserted into the bottle and then used on the next client. Fun fungus loves greasy, fatty environments. And so unlike polished, which is basically will kill anything, um, oil will make it live. And so when you are using a cuticle oil, I recommend using a dropper mm -hmm. um, and not going from, you know, client to client that way. Um, I hope those tips are helpful. I mean, I, I could go on and on about, you know, salon sanitation, but I'm sure you know most of us. Cautions, yes. Some, I know that we talked to a nail tech um, in Nebraska uh, not too long ago, and she was telling us it's actually illegal there to have the brush touch client to client, which was kind of like, well, duh. Unfortunately, it's not common sense though. No. My so if you do use an oil that doesn't have a dropper, drip it off the brush and don't touch the brush to the skin. Mm -hmm. And if your oil has things floating in it, it's obviously been compromised and you need to replace it. Yes. My, my solar oil bottle has a dropper that it, I always use that. Right. And another precaution that we want to make sure everyone is on board with, 
before you put your tools that are disinfectable into your liquid, they need to be thoroughly cleaned with soap and water. And if your disinfection liquid has things floating in it, it's no longer effective. It needs to be replaced. And you should be switching that out daily anyway. Okay, another question kind of goes along with this was from Phyllis. What about cross-contamination um, to spread from polish and monomers? Well, like we had said, there's nothing there that can, um, funguses and bacteria can live in. Would you uh, concur with that? Yes, yes. For sure. Okay. Um, yeah. Victoria, if you would, we see your question about those specific types of bacteria. If you would, Dr. Stern is in the attendees for the conversation. If you could private message her. For one thing, I can't pronounce all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and for another, I think in a private message, you'll be able to send her the photo so that she can more effectively answer your question. Yes, we're not ignoring that. We want to get you a, a better, more complete answer. Yes. Happy to do that. Do we have one after Phyllis? Um, sanitizable files? What's the doctor's? Victoria also asked, what is the doctor's opinion about sanitizable files? Mm. So the cardboard emery boards are not sanitizable. Right. Um, I, I saw your comment that certain states allow sanitizable files. I presume you're referring to like the glass or crystal files or perhaps files that are metal. Um, those materials can be sanitized, absolutely. You obviously have to um, you know, follow the, the typical um, disinfection protocol for things like that. Um, so yes, there are materials that are sanitizable, but anything porous um, that you know is made out of cardboard, it, it's not sanitizable. What about a foam core board? Some manufacturers say that their their boards that have a foam core are disinfectable. You know, I. I don't want to guess on this, but I, I'm suspicious. Right. So err on the side of caution and use a new file for every person, unless it's glass or metal. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I personally, back in the olden days when I was newer, had been attending classes because I was using files that a manufacturer said they're reusable, you can disinfect them, et cetera. And being new in the salon, I was trying to save money everywhere I could and cleaning them. And I actually had someone say, well, you're actually wasting time using a used file. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. So being the geek that I am, I went ahead and literally on my client profiles was writing this client. I used a new file. This is how long the service took this client. The file's been used twice or three times, et cetera. This is how long the service took. And I found I, when I broke down my service and calculated how much I was making per minute, that I was spending more <laughs> money on the time it took to use a used file than what I would have spent on using a new file for every client. So that, that may, that's interesting. You did your own little study there. Yeah. I'm kind of <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, time is money, as we know, and that's interesting. Absolutely. We have a question from Lisa. Lisa works at a private aesthetic school. She drops the cuticle oil into a Dappen dish so that they can apply it with a Q-tip for each client so their clients never touch the dropper or the brush that's in the oil. That's a really great suggestion. Lisa. Thank you. Love that. One. Love that. And nope. Mo says there are the regular foam boards. The state of Florida does not differentiate. So if you are using files that your manufacturer claims they're disinfectable, you need to check with your state boards to be sure that your state board allows that. Excellent. And I I want to add with these one-time use items, we're not only concerned about fungus, 
There are obviously, you know, other concerns. A big one are viral um, things such as warts, you know, plantar warts. We call warts near the nail or in the nail, periungual um, verruca vulgaris. Very hard to get rid of, very hard to treat. I often have to surgically remove portions of the nail to really get them. Nightmare. Yeah. And that can be transmitted from these porous items as well. So if I didn't convince you with the fungus. <laughs> <laughs> you got us with the viral yep, yep. words. Well, gross. Yeah. So our hour has just flown by for today's broadcast. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Stern. And I will it was a real pleasure. website link again for you all in the comments so that you can um, check out her website. She is also a regular columnist for Nails Magazine, so you can check her out in the print edition or the digital edition of Nails Magazine. Or as, on their website. Yes, as Sorry. well as find her on the website. And before we go, I just have to say congratulations on the new grandbaby <laughs> this weekend. Yay! Yay. Yay. CFF Mel has a new grandbaby. Yes, we had a new grandbaby number four, yes. born on Saturday. Um, if you noticed, I got up and walked away from the broadcast for a minute because I have my three-year-old grandson here today. He is in my chair. He's in the room. behaving <laughs> very, very well. Yes. But we had... Wow, I'm impressed. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sleeping... We didn't hear a peep. So we had Declan Douglas join us. He was eight pounds, one ounce, and 19 wow. inches long. Awesome. So... And he is... So exciting. Yes. So <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for letting me break for a minute. <laughs> And for those of you that have enjoyed asking Dr. Stern questions and talking to her, she will be available at the Foot Forward Summit in Atlanta. Yes, and we leave a week, a week, we leave a month from today. No, so excited. <laughs> wow. And got their travel plans for Atlanta laid out. Did you notice in the Fingernail Fixer blog, I have given you tips on saving money for travel in two separate blogs. So you have no excuses not to be joining us in Atlanta. Yes, and <laughs> broadcasting the second Monday of the month of August. Yes, is while we're in Atlanta, and we will be broadcasting live from there. Maybe we'll actually get to talk to Dr. Dana again in person. Yes, in person. person. If you looking can... forward to it, it's yeah. going to be a wonderful conference. Yeah, it's going to be so much fun. Like totally foot focused. Can't wait to. I can't wait to meet everybody. You know, I'm always writing my columns, and but it's going to be fun to meet people in person. You can like hang out with all the nail geeks. Okay, I'm. Yeah. Stacy asked about the cost. I'm not entirely sure the cost of the conference itself, but I believe you have until the 12th of this month to register and get a hundred dollars off the entry. Yes, and I'll hop on and Stacy. I'll leave the comment with the link for the cost part on the Foot Forward Summit website, or it's footforwardsummit.com if you want to visit that to get all of the information on cost for the summit itself. Uh, again, we'll be broadcasting the second Monday in August at our usual time, 11 Central, noon on the East Coast, <laughs> nine on the West Coast, and 5 p.m.-ish in London. Katie, correct us <laughs> if that's wrong. And we're looking forward to seeing you. If you're not able mm. to make the Foot Forward Summit, and you have questions for one of the presenters that you'd like us to get answered, shoot one of us a private message, either Mills <coughs> Tips of the Trade or Fingernail Fixer, and we'll be sure to get those questions answered for you at Summit and include them in the broadcast. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time. And Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time and coming on, Dr. Stern. Thank you. Thank you. All have a great day. Out there. Nail, Nail on. on. Is it done? It is done.